Hello, everyone. This is Keith Stone with the Center for Atlantic Studies, and this is another edition of the Cosmos Society Online Open House. Um, I'm here with Luke Hollis, our honored guest today. I'm very pleased to have you. Um, let me give you the brief introduction here. Um, Luke is the founder of Archimedes Digital, a digital humanities startup based in Cambridge, Mass., our fair city. Rather than creating software that further distracts and isolates users, the artists, developers, and archivists at Archimedes build applications that connect us to our shared traditions and cultures. Archimedes partners with libraries, museums, and archives internationally to develop applications across web, mobile, augmented reality, and virtual reality platforms. Luke is concerned with the transmission of print culture into its digital form and knowledge and information design in emerging media. So, Luke, I said that I would interrogate you about your interest in classics. Um, could you give us um, the rundown, I guess, on how you how you first came to be so interested in classics? And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's uh, you know th that's a good question. Um, I grew up in the Midwest uh, in a small uh, town of two thousand in uh, Nebraska. Um, and I fell in love with the uh, pastoral tradition of literature, especially, um, and how it was talking about, uh, you know, uh, the uh, landscape and uh, fields and uh, uh, families that I grew up interacting with and a part of. Hmm. Um, so it started from there, um, and I started getting interested in reading uh, uh, some of the uh, original uh, pastoral poets in Latin, and then tracing them back to their sources in Greek as well. Um, so you were at a school that offered Latin, or did you pick this up on your own? Uh, that's right. I was a classical languages uh, major in my undergrad. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, I just like to do that on every with everyone um, before we start. So now, floor is yours, um, and we have some slides. So just let us know when you need them. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Let me pull this up over here. All right. Great. Um, cool. Thank you for sharing the slides. Uh, um, and let me just get the text pulled up over here. And my computer just decided to go to sleep on me. Sorry. <laughs> it's not the way it goes. There we go. All right. So um, thank you to Keith and thank you to everyone for that's joining us today um, here in this Hangout and, and elsewhere. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion as we think about what it means to represent Hellenistic culture, especially in digital media and kind of what decisions we need to make to do our source content justice um, in its digital format. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Um, for some context at the Center for Linux Studies, we're working on building digital versions of classical texts and artifacts with a larger goal of not just making data accessible in a tangible way, but uh, next slide. Um, to do something, to do what they mentioned here in this uh, book called Digital Humanities, to reshape and remodel humanistic knowledge as it departs from print or the oral culture that it was originally transmitted by and enters the digital formats. As a part of this, we'd argue that the creation of digital versions of classical texts and artifacts that we're archiving at the CHS is a participatory creative act in conversation with the original classical poet or vase painter or sculptor, whoever it might be, whose work we're archiving. When we think about digital editions, um, commentaries, and collection interfaces at the Center for Lenox Studies, we're not only trying to digitize our source content, but also subvert or break away from many conventions of written or print cultures that have shaped our libraries, schools, and archives, along with our collective ways of thinking for millennia. Um, so my hopes for this informal you know, discussion at the open house today um, are that each of us will be able to participate in considering how to create digital versions of classical data um, with a few examples that we'll look at, one from the CHS media database for a session today, that uh, is a collection of Attic Greek hydria that uh, Gregory Nash has mentioned in his writing. Um, when we build these archives, we feel like we're participating in some way in the creation of classical Hellenic, Hellenistic culture. And, and one of the subjects of conversation that I hope we can touch on is how the creation of digital content parallels the creation of the original texts and artifacts. Um, in doing this, we'll examine the decisions we make with information architecture, interface design, and above all, as kind of an umbrella term that Keith already mentioned, uh, knowledge design. 
for electronic representations of Hellenistic culture, and then compare our various outcomes to the previous print or written traditions of data transmission. And specifically, I'm wondering uh, if we can get to it, if when we move away from the strict linear progression of written and print culture into a digital medium instead, we may find more similarities with oral culture than print culture, um, considering parallels perhaps with strategies that other people in this hangout know uh, much better than myself with something like ring composition or chiastic structure. Um, but those considerations are probably too speculative at this point to be fruitful um, in some ways. So we have more con concrete examples to look at. Um, for a short background of why we do what we do, uh, I started Archimedes as an experiment four and a half years ago now by asking if instead of building software that continues to distract and isolate us from each other, we intentionally focused on building the software that connects us to our shared traditions and cultures. Uh, today, I'd argue we build the digital version of our collective imagination, Hellenistic or not, um, as we br bring archives, museums, and archaeological sites around the world into the digital realm. Specifically at the CHS, we focus on developing the digital version of classical Hellenic imagination as represented in these texts and artifacts that we primarily deal with. Uh, so if you go to the next slide here, um, there's a lot of people that we owe credit to in these endeavors. Um, Sally and among these are the really incredible humans that I get to work with day in and day out to create these digital archives. Um, so just going down the list, uh, that's Brian Lee, lead immersive engineer and director of all XR technologies. Demir Katarik, product designer and jack of all trades that facilitates innovation across numerous media. Hao Wu, the director of web services through our technologies to ensure they're the bedrock of the archival uh, platforms that we're creating. Then myself and Paul Pickering, um, the partnerships director who uh, in his bio, unlike Amenhotep III, is a qualified agile coach. Um, we practice the creation of these digital archives uh, as following in the major footsteps of digital classicists and human, digital humanist predecessors. Um, uh, so if you go to the next slide here, uh, such as the Ibicus machine, there is generally an original Ibicus system in uh, the basement of House E at the Center for Hellenic Studies. So uh, one of these days we'll have to unearth it. Uh, but uh, if you haven't heard of the Ibicus system before, um, one of our digital humanist predecessors was David W. Packard, the son of the Packard from Hewlett Packard, who repurposed his father's work to build the Ibicus system that you see. Um, this was the first digital version of classical Greek texts, which extended the potential of the early computing systems to do natural language processing and search on classical documents like no one had been able to do before. So uh, the, you know, the moral that we took from this was wherever you extend the potential imaginative space of the implementation of a given technology, you open the door for others to do the same. What David W. Packard did for the early computer, we hope similarly to do with our digital archives, hijacking existing technologies to build the electronic version of the archives and museums that we partner with. We recognize that the field is still relatively young um, in, this, in this endeavor as well. You know, comparatively, you can imagine that what people were thinking about publications wise when the first printing press was only a few decades old was pretty narrow in scope still. Um, and as a result, we understand that the projects we create are much more the foundations of what we hope to build in future years, like this Ibicus system. Um, uh, we, and we understand uh, along with that, sometimes our work currently can be much more about utility than creativity, but we're continually inspired by challenging and challenged by our comrades and other technological communities as well, um, such as some of the most influentials have been, recently have been game developers, uh, actual video game developers, um, that work in 3D interfaces, and we'll look at that in a second. So uh, next slide. The first project that we undertook to kind of reshape and rethink these print conventions at the CHS was the Homer Commentary in Progress. Uh, this was publishing an evolving commentary on Homer's works in a digital format that is multimedia, fully searchable, and is intended by its commentators to establish a new paradigm for publishing classical commentaries. And we'll hear more from that in a sec, uh, more from them in a second. So if we visit this link briefly, but that's fine, we don't have to do that. Uh, we can just stay here. We can see the Homer Commentary in Progress homepage, several commentators, um, different data visualizations displaying the distribution of comments and significant words and ideas for the commentary. Um, so you can see in the search tools in the top bar here, um, you can filter by words or by work and similarly search for different people by the uh, reading comments from a given commentator. Um, 
if you get into the comments themselves, like you're looking at, you can see um, them displayed alongside several different editions and translations of the source text of the Iliad. Um, so the default view uh, of this uh, initial passage from the start of the Iliad is uh, Venice SA that was digitized by the Homer multi-text uh, project. Um, and you can also toggle to the OCT and display a translation created by the Center for Linux Studies commentators become translators. Um, you can put all of this, if you click on that context button, into a context sidebar next to the commentary as you're reading it as well. The multiple editions and translations take advantage of the digital format to dispel the presuppositions of a single canonical version of Homer that has no room for variant readings from the manuscript edition. Instead, what we hope to build was the multiplicity of these readings being embraced by the CHS commentators as an, and the subject of open discussion. So um, if you head to the next slide here. Uh, yep, there's the translations and also keywords uh, next to uh, this comment by Greg. Um, and next slide. Um, as Leonard Mueller, the, a commentator in the com uh, commentaries in progress and, and also a mastermind of them um, at the CHS writes, uh, in a paper for interdisciplinary conference on commentaries held more than 20 years ago, that was similar at least in some ways to the present one. This is where he was reading this. The Oxford Latinist Don Fowler spoke of two kinds of commentary. One that is like the one I've been describing in which problems are raised and as he puts it foreclosed so that there is nothing more to say. The commentators are like doctors. They are never allowed to admit uncertainty, but are expected where there is no solution to say that there is no problem. The other is the kind of commentator that Fowler himself aspired to be in a commentary on the first 332 lines of book two of Lucretius, in which the goal is to open the text to its readers rather than shut it down. Such commentaries are not so much guides of the, for the perplexed, but guides into complexity and a sense of greater rather than lesser difficulty. Fowler, who died in 1999 at the age of 46, was also interested in the possibilities of online commentaries, which he envisions as, envisaged as texts that by virtue of their markup in TEI XML, uh, a technology that was just emerging at the time, could blur the distinction between text and commentary. For example, he imagined that Homeric text could be color coded in their repetitious phraseology, or that individual words in a poem could be marked up for the relative frequency within a text or corpus. But he also thought that electronic commentaries, as he called them, would offer us the opportunity to provide ourselves with infinitely large margins to our text, to fill them as we will with our notes, from vocabulary cribs to conjectures. I embraced with enthous enthusiasm the labyrinthian complexity and deferral, he was using Derrida's term, that such a view of the commentary presupposes. He also thinks of the commentary and its pleasures as irredeemably personal. Uh, next slide. So we were inspired by this idea of the infinite margin that Lenny mentioned and continued the work of creating a new reading environment for the CHS publications and an annotation system that went alongside it that you can see here. Um, this reading environment is simple, but generally has feature parity with some of the other conventional digital reading environments such as Scribd as it's inspired to take advantage of the medium for the trove of the CHS publications. This meant creating simple versions of features, such as resuming your place and reading where you left off and adding your own bookmark to the text alongside the uh, annotation system. So this is a screenshot from the CHS website um, with the, of the Particles in Ancient Greek, Greek Discourse, um, five volumes exploring particle use across genres from the Linux Studies series in 2016. Um, and uh, next slide. Along with the commentaries and reading interface with annotations, we similarly did some initial community building with the feed of all of the activity across these commentaries and annotations so that users can see what is currently being published on the CHS web properties related to the commentaries. This is an early stage of what we hope may be the most dynamic part of the process of digital archive creation and one of its success metrics, namely the adoption of the technology by the larger community. Um, so this is up at profile.chs.harvard.edu. You can see all of the recent community activity from the commentaries. Um, here's two uh, comments that Lenny just published, as well as the annotations environment going down that list. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, great. At the same time as this development was occurring at the CHS with largely the text-based resources that we just saw, um, we were working with a few different archeological excavations for similar goals, but that had very different types of data you can see. Um, 
there are images. These here are images and screen records from the Contrada Agnese project excavations at the ancient city of Morgantina in Sicily, where we used um, georeferenced photogrammetry, an ArcGIS geospatial database, and museum data to create an AR application to exist, assist both excavators and provide uh, interpretive reconstruction materials for site tourists. Specifically, these reconstructions represent a third century Hellenistic city that you see here after an aggressive building campaign under King Hieron II um, that funded the creation of a major monumental architecture in these reconstructions. Um, this is before Morgantina backed the wrong side in the Second Punic War, which led to the sacking, the sacking of the city in 211 BC, in which the Roman army seized control of Morgantina and awarded the city to Spanish mercenaries. In the GIF on the right-hand side, you can see a fountain house in the Agra at Morgantina. And then if you, this is the fountain house right there um, that you can walk into and explore. Um, looking at the, this is a screen record from the tablet envisioned on, uh, uh, image on the left. Um, and if you turn around, you look across the Agora to see um, the stoa on the other side. Uh, this is significant because this is the it's a gigantic uh, space uh, it's the second biggest agora in all of hellenistic culture after only athens um, and there's only the the most basic foundations of these structures uh, out uh, above ground um, on site today um, uh, so if you go to the next slide along with the reconstructions um, and the interpretive materials that were involved in the uh, the last image we just saw, we also displayed the active excavations in AR, um, which shows the data where it was originally buried and then uncovered by the excavation team. Um, we are hoping, uh, and then the blue lines here on the left that you can see are the city plan um, uh, to see how it matches up with the um, city blocks that, that they were uncovering. Uh, this is the all of the points of the geo database, um, and they're joined to the museum finds data. So if we search for all the finds that are coins, for instance, you can see it filter through um, the, the geo database until you actually go walk over and click on one, and then you can bring up that coin or that find record from the museum uh, from the museum database. Um, yeah, we hope this would take advantage of the digital format to return the data to its exact location where these artifacts had resided for you know, 2,000, 2,300 years, um, something close to that. So uh, similarly, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, a little bit closer to home, we partnered with the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography to visualize the active excavations in Harvard Yard with a field school class that spends one semester excavating and one semester processing the finds and conserving them at the museum. You actually, this uh, just had an update that launched um, last week. So you can download on either App Store the most recent release of this. Um, and if you're out in uh, the yard uh, walking around, you can, it will use your device GPS to position the trench, trench models of the trenches that they excavated in the, uh, uh, in augmented reality in front of you. So you can go walk, you know, kind of look down into the dirt and see the finds, uh, uh, see where the finds were found and see what the soil looks like, interpret the um, different years of excavation as they've gotten added to this application. Um, uh, and next slide. Um, the worlds of what we've been creating for the CHS and the archeological digs both merged for us at the Harvard Semitic Museum, where we adapted some of the same technologies from our commentaries and the translations interfaces to create an augmented reality application for the dream Stella of Thutmose IV at the, uh, at the Semitic Museum. Um, the dream Stella of Thutmose uh, is this you know, monumental Stella you can see on the left there that rests between the paws of the Sphinx in Egypt. And the Semitic Museum has the most up-to-date, accurate uh, cast reproduction of this as it's been eroded by the sand on display in their second floor gallery. We enable users to translate the hieroglyphs on the stella and see the sphinx surrounding it in the gallery space as if they were standing between the sphinx's paws. Um, so that's what you can see as he moves the device around um, with the screen record and looks up, you can see the sphinx looking back down at you. 
um, to get a better sense of the scale and verticality as if you were actually there. Um, uh, this project especially presented us a way that we could start thinking about digital cultural creation in a hybrid sense across both the 2D hieroglyphs and text translation and 3D artifacts and monuments interfaces. Uh, so in augmented reality, you start to get kind of this weird sense of the new life that these artifacts can take place in their digital guise, such as the students interacting with the Sphinx here on the right. We feel challenged and challenged consistently by such an undertaking preserving these artifacts, and in part, this challenge derives from our belief that digitization of classical texts and artifacts is a parallel and participatory creative process that works in tandem with the original creators of these of this content. Uh, I'd argue to adequately represent the imaginative opera of the original creators then. A digital humanist or classicist must be in touch with the original medium and at least some creative intentions of the maker. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, uh, to, to restate this, I'd argue that the complexities of digitization and archive creation require being more conversant with the original content, um, uh, more than just conversant with the original content, but even perhaps somehow, you know, um, Metaphorically, channeling the original imagination of the creator and responding to it in, in the presentation of this data. The digitization of classical texts and artifacts um, it seems to participate in this parallel and creative uh, process that works in tandem with the original creators, so that in building these digital archives, in some ways, I, I would argue at least, one taps into the original imagination of the maker and perpetuates cultural creation of the original culture in a similar but parallel manner. Um, uh, for next slide, um, great. Uh, for example, we can see here uh, the process for a concrete example. We can see the process of photogrammetry, um, creating a 3D model of sculpture from a bunch of 2D images. So each of these blue um, squares is a photograph and the photographs, when they get put into the software, uh, the software can identify where they, what position they were taken from, and then uh, begin to reconstruct um, points. As you can see, the, the little dots slowly f filling out on the sculpture, um, that uh, using uh, the, their algorithms uh, create uh, points of the actual uh, sculpture that they're imaging. Um, but yeah, so each image adds a set of individual separate point cloud data that gradually accumulates into the full picture that is reconstructed then afterwards into a mesh by algorithms. So uh, there's a bunch of point clouds data, uh, just a bunch of indiv individual points until a separate algorithm that has nothing to do with the original sculpture itself goes and turns all these separate points into a full mesh uh, that is a 3D model that could be used in a mobile device or in a VR headset or any of those other um, places where you might see it. Um, the digital version, I think, is something wholly separate and a project that could computer science in some ways, as much as it is the original sculptor. So um, next slide. Great. Moving forward, we're next focusing on being more strategic about continuing to break away or kind of refigure the previous conventions of print culture. Um, or if not completely break away, you know, at least reconceptualize what the possibilities of electronic culture affords us that print culture may not be uh, able to do in the creation of an open platform. Um, so, so that all public users on our next project are, will be able to publish their own digital editions and commentaries of classical texts at the CHS. Um, this project was christened by uh, Greg as the New Alexandria Project, um, which is a digital library that we hope in some ways can be similarly as expansive in providing resources and the tools for others to be creative um, participating in building all uh, digital versions of pre-medieval culture. Um, next slide. The base of this and why it's why I mentioned pre-medieval is it, that it is over 5,300 works in the Center for Linux text server that's available at this uh, link here um, that are compliant to canonical text services or CTS standards developed by Neil Smith and Christopher Blackwell. Um, the digital versions of these texts are curated by the Open Greek and Latin Project, the Perseus Project, and the Classical Language Toolkit. 
They represent documents from around the world in 14 different languages before the inventing, invention of the printing press. So this was the cutoff proposed by Kyle P. Johnson, founder of the CLTK, for the CTS compliant text curated by the CLTK and similarly adopted for the new Alexandria. Uh, next slide. With Alexandria, we're hoping to empower each commentator, translator, or curator to be creative with their data and digital medium. We continue this, we intend this platform to share and participate in building community across many different fields that work with textual criticism and close reading for understanding. In doing this on a digital platform specifically, we intend for continued knowledge creation and enactment of our shared cultures where scholars are publishing their own editions, commentaries, and translations. Um, next slide. This is a real example of what a user creating a comment, uh, creating a comment on their own digital edition looks like right now. Um, so we're informed uh, by several other projects, you know, both humanities oriented, like Recogito, which is part of the Pelagius Commons, uh, Scape Digital Library Viewer, um, uh, and general public web applications uh, like Medium.com, as well as Google Arts and Culture, uh, to inform this uh, platform and the user experience digitizing this content. Um, next slide. One of the ways that we see people in the field being most creative with coming up with is this new type of discourse that's kind of emerging that's somewhere between a journal article uh, with a lot of scholarly value and a blog post in a shorter, you know, more compact digital medium. Uh, a good example of this is the CHS's excellent classical inquiries um, that uh, Keith works on. Um, in which Greg and uh, several others, you know, publish these brilliant articles that range across a wide array of publication media um, that involve embeds of classical texts um, alongside archival items from collection platforms um, and contemporary video references on YouTube. Uh, really is kind of just all encompassing in this uh, kind of, you know, uh, melding pot of, of the imagination that takes all these things in and then puts them out in a digital format. To facilitate this at the CHS now and for the general public soon, uh, this right here is the interface for creating what we're just calling so far a post, right? Which is a, a digital item with this embedded media source text and commentary alongside the larger form text piece. Um, so here's one about education in ancient Greece. Um, and if you go, as you go down the body content, you can see an embedded uh, commentary content. This is a little bit small um, with uh, the start of the Iliad source text and then a uh, commentary uh, following it by Greg, um, the, an actual uh, source text itself without comments and then an item at the very uh, bottom there, an item from a collections interface. Um, and if you click on that item, then it takes you to the item record and shows you the metadata, deep image zoom tools, and everything else that we've kind of been exploring from the um, from the interface. So uh, this, more than anything, I think, is one of the most pragmatic and relatively straightforward response from us to some of our discussions about how electronic culture can and will and continue to subvert or repurpose the established conventions of print culture, where we're able to not only just reference with a citation, go see this comment on Iliad 1, we can now embed it directly there um, and have that content be dynamic. Uh, next slide. In order to build this, we developed a design system in progress as well. Um, at this link that you can check out if it's interesting. Um, that is, and this is utilized for publishing all types of humanities related archival data sets. Um, uh, next slide. And one early manifestation of the CHS media database that you can take a look at if you click on this link, but we don't have to right now, um, is the CHS database. The CHS media database is still in progress, but you can search and view items and collections of figures. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you want to see all of the figures from all of Greg's works, um, you can search for them um, and uh, see uh, what characters are most cited, um, uh, view what types of vessels were cited, especially like the Attic Hydra that we'll take a look at here in a second. 
um, and then view them with deep image zoom tools and other uh, searchable metadata and artifacts. So uh, if you take a look at the next slide, our newest iteration of this collections platform, uh, yep, that's pending release soon appears like this. Um, the, here's, this is an example arch arch archive um, that I created with the several of the terracotta vessels that Greg mentioned in his works, um, but filling out uh, their metadata uh, to be a little bit more robust. Um, so you can see in the right-hand column, uh, our API goes uh, back through our database, gets all of the unique values of all of the different types of metadata that are associated with these black figure hydria, and then creates pathways for users to search on dimensions or exhibition history or medium, object history, place of creation, and so forth. Um, while not all of these will be, you know, uh, you, uh, you would imagine not all of these would be immediately useful for search possibilities. Um, I think that's one of the questions that we're continuing to try to figure out and discover as we're building these interfaces. Um, is searching on dimensions useful? Um, it might be for someone, and how do we need? How do we represent? How does search that uh, criteria? Um, so, and if you go to the next slide, an individual object record uh, from the database is displayed here. Um, this is just a Hydria with the fight of Achilles and Memnon um, from the Walters. Uh, for the purposes of this, you know, uh, we're assuming if it was uh, part of the CHS uh, database, um, just for the purposes of uh, this example archive, um, that representing it here with the full metadata, uh, this uh, all all of this data already is in the public domain. Um, and uh, next slide is well, um, because most of the things we build now are in this. Uh, kind of crossover space between VR and AR both. Um, we also have to build in 3D, for, build these interfaces in their 3D environments um, uh, for the archeological projects. So we're adapting the design system that we created um, um, from the last uh, 2D interface that we took a look at into these 3D environments in AR and VR. Um, so one such uh, 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 example where we're implementing this so far, uh, if you go to the next slide, is with uh, guided tours and a virtual telepresence VR classroom in the Giza Plateau with the Giza Project at Harvard. So just in the same way on a 2D interface, you would go down a list of artifacts in a collection uh, or archival items in a collection. Uh, in a 3D interface, suddenly going down that list of artifacts is jumping around in the 3D environment to different positions uh, to see these artifacts where they're created uh, or where, where they're displayed in the reconstruction. Um, uh, next slide. So uh, we continue to face a number of challenges in creating this design system and figuring out how we want to go about uh, knowledge design for uh, displaying this data. But um, one of the biggest challenges that I wanted to touch on before you know, bridging out into our discussion further is as described in the Digital Humanities book that I cite here. Um, and this, the full quote goes, uh, digital humanities projects can be described by sketching their structure at several different levels. These begin with basic computation for programming, processing, and protocols, and extend through the levels of organization and output that form the basis of most users' experience, that is, interface devices and networks. The foundational layer, computation, relies on principles that are, on the surface, at odds with humanistic methods. Specifically, computation depends on disambiguation at every level, from encoding to the structuring of information. Explicit step-by-step -step procedures form the basis of computation activity. However, ambiguity and implicit assumptions are crucial to the humanities. In the intersection between these two domains, humanists have given in to the demands of process that requires that they work in accord with its methods. Indeed, this is a challenge for the development of the digital humanities, namely the ways in which ambiguity, interpretation, contingency, positionality, and different differential approaches can be embodied in computation. 
Um, so this was a major consideration for us uh, when we discussed the deci decisions in knowledge design and in digital cultural creation, where in some ways a record in the database must be an exact specific thing and only mean that one thing. Um, or all of the points in that point cloud of the uh, sculpture that was being digitized by the photogrammetry. Each of those is a specific you know, uh, datum that is, needs to be exact and have no ambiguity to it in some ways. Um, whereas when we're displaying this data uh, and thinking about how to create, you know, how to enact knowledge design for the you know interpretive traditions of close reading um, that require ambiguity and facilitate creating new meanings like the second type of commentators rather than the first type of commentators. Um, we're trying to figure out you know how to present this so that ambiguities how to uh, present this so that the ambiguities that um, these authors in digital humanities mention uh, are uh, reflected in the interfaces that we're creating. Um, and to open up maybe the discussion from here in this way, uh, if we want to look at the next slide, the short homework from the blog post, um, it was to find a classical text or artifact in a digital archive online, um, such as one such archive is the Acropolis Museum at Google Arts and Culture here. And think about how does the digital version of the text or artifact differ from the original? Um, and how does the metadata that's displayed with this text or artifact change the way that it's discovered by archive users? And is there any change to or variation of the original by the choice of metadata included with the digital version? So uh, I was focusing on the metadata in considering this only in the sense that um, the, you know, the metadata for individual item records is an easy way to jump into the discussion because this uh, the, the choice of what metadata is displayed or included in the archive determines somewhat of the potentiality of the user exploration of that archive. So again, you know, if you have dimensions on all of your artifacts and that's the metadata that you wanted to choose and display, that would allow users to search for small artifacts or large artifacts um, or, you know, searching by color or uh, composition material. Um, uh, is it just that we want to include everything? How do we want to include uh, the most relevant aspects of the data? Um, I think those are the questions that we're trying to answer. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll go to this link in a second, but um, adding on to this, yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to thank the CHS team definitely for their tireless efforts um, that continue to amaze and uh, impress me. Uh, with all of the uh, deeply, deeply creative people that uh, makes these things happen. So um, thanks for that. And um, let's see here. Um, if we can go back to the last slide just momentarily. Yeah, OK, great. And click on this uh, Google Arts and Culture. Um, I think this is interesting because because to look at because it's very different for a very different purpose than most of the uh, collections interfaces that we in interact with. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to open that link? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, stand by. I'll need to. I'll need to that. switch. I'll need to switch screens. So just give me a sec. Okay. Uh, okay. So, sorry, I, I'll, I'll, I will no. be a moment. No, sorry. Yeah, no problem. I could screen share too. Would that be useful? Sounds good. All right, let's share here. Is that coming through now? Mm, yes, we can see your screen, I believe, Luke. Awesome. That's great. So let's look down here. Um, uh, so to go through, actually, um, 
It makes sense. Can we go through a few of these links really quickly? Um, let's see here. Uh, the Homer commentary in progress. Um, there's multiple commentaries now, both uh, Pindar and Pausanias commentaries that all have their own, uh, you know, significant separate feature set. Um, and uh, we get to see commentators, um, data visualization for exploring the distribution of comments, um, significant words and ideas, and then uh, toggling between different versions and different uh, translations of the commentary here. Um, because this is going to give me problems in the demo. Isn't that the way it goes? Um, but let's see here. Uh, we open up our commentary and just go in slowly. Um, uh, we'll be, uh, you can, yeah, I think it's just going slowly on my band, uh, my, my connection currently. Um, you can see the translations and open up a full translation panel. Um, next to uh, the commentary itself as you're reading. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, commentary panel. Um, so uh, uh, similarly with uh, some of these other uh, archeological digs, I don't think there was anything to take a look at there, uh, but we can take a look at the CHS um, database that was migrated here um, the CHS uh, uh, collections database, if we want to see some of the collections that are available, the Fleming collection, all figures from uh, these different publications, and then figures from um, Greg's writing uh, as, as these are starting to be built and uh, metadata is added to them. So those are the two main touch points to take a look at so far. And then um, this is the an example of a uh, digital collections that I thought we might, uh, you know, mention in passing only in the sense that uh, it's very different from, I think, a lot of our other digital collections databases um, in the way that it, it's explored. You can explore, you know, by composition here, kind of. They have their own subsets of the collections, everything that's rock or marble or sculpture. Um, and then you have this interface at the bottom that lets you organized by uh, a flame emoji, which I organizing by popularity, right? Um, uh, which is something that I don't think, uh, you know, uh, we consider very often in our uh, display of these in, in other uh, potentially more academic interfaces. Um, and uh, also display on a timeline, uh, which is cool. So if you display the, uh, you know, actual, um, um, the creation of these uh, suggested if there's a range, you know, approximate creation of these. And finally, um, organized by color. There's not too many colors in this different in, in this collection, but if you want to see uh, items that are more terracotta colored or more stone, you know, uh, marble colored, you can uh, browse and explore in, in this way. I noticed there are only 24 items in this collection. Um, is this uh, meant to be um, a condensation, I suppose? Or is it the idea to add more more items to this eventually? Um, this is you know, quite a mm -hmm. um, large collection that this museum has. So I know, yeah. this, you know this isn't it. Um, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you click you know, the Explore button, you can go walk through it as if you were walking through. Uh -huh. Google Maps. I did not click that button. Yeah. I so they, <laughs> yeah, they they have you know uh, many more um, artifacts that are present in this walkthrough than are actually in the collections interface. That's right. Um, wow, so that's I, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, you know, start off with that uh, because it really shows you the spectrum of uh, how you present um, the, uh, you know, humanistic culture in this case at the Acropolis Museum in very different formats influences the way that uh, you people start to understand this data, whether you're organizing by popularity, date, color, um, and what sort of metadata you're displaying alongside it. So here you can click on the 
creator, um, of the Phidias workshop um, did created uh, dimensions, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that's it. I can turn off uh, screen share. Um, so I guess for uh, for opening up the discussion, I was wondering, did anyone does anyone have a um, archive or a digital collection that they found uh, somewhere that they were interested in discussing or felt you know shape this sort of knowledge in an interesting way? Well, we had a question from the forum, so if I can maybe put up an example that yeah. um, if I can get the screen share that I can get. You can see that. Uh, and and the comment here is that, um, uh, you know, sometimes seeing an image online doesn't match kind of the quality or the content of the original. Uh, and this example, the so-called Mem Non Pieta, uh, you can see it online in, in, this, uh, in this sort of format. So I'll just hide that. Uh, and so the comment is, well, what is this? It looks like a plate, uh, you know, a decorative plate of some sort. But it's actually a cup seen from above. And then the, uh, he's making the point that when it was originally used, as people emptied the content, the image was revealed more and more. And that aspect of the original is barely understood by an image like this. Uh, so I wondered what, uh, how, how you think maybe you could um, tackle that aspect. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, uh, how. Uh, not only are the digital versions, you know, separate, but sometimes they genuinely misrepresent uh, or mislead users uh, as they're exploring these archives. Um, the uh, uh, th that's a great question from the forum um, to examine. Uh, I think, kind of, the why it's important to consider the act of digital archiving as a creative act where you're understanding the medium of the original content to represent it in the right way. Um, I know I'm kind of picking on the organizing by popularity, but um, if people organize by the popularity of seeing this cup from the top down, uh, because it's the most maybe interesting or compelling view um, that you might have, I would you know, be cautious of how that would then represent or twist the original culture. Um, and so how um, how can or is the original purpose or use that an artifact was put to something that maybe needs to be brought into play? Entirely. Um, I think that's a great that's a great question. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, an important way to um, consider this practice as, uh, you know, Many of other creative disciplines. Um, uh, that's why I think they're they're continuing cultural creation, uh, whether even if it's from a classical cultural that hasn't had a actual you know physical uh, potter working for millennia. We're continuing that cultural creation still, again, in understanding the purpose of those vessels um, and figuring out how to replicate their digital avatars, uh, digital the, the digital versions of themselves. Yeah. Um, but uh, a, a creative practice or uh, similarly a, a discipline in, in criticizing a, a critical practice as well, not only being the creating, but uh, having the criticism to understand and write about these texts and artifacts and do the interpretation too, because I don't think you're going to ever be able to get away from your own interpretation entirely. Um, there's no way that, you know, you could preserve millions of those little uh, dots in the point cloud, right, of, of the sculpture, but you're never going to get back to complete fidelity of the original thing, right, uh, entirely. So that's, that's a great question. Yeah, it occurs to me that that's, that, um, that photographic view of that cup is kind of like um, words on a page or the Iliad, for, for example, specifically say, we know that it's um, meant for oral performance. It's not, you know, Homer didn't publish it as a book. Mm -hmm. So until it's performed, it's not at all the same. And this, this cup as well, how can one show the performance or participate in the performance of this? You know, in a museum, do you, do you have a bunch of, you know, reproductions of this and here's some juice and I mean, Maybe just a video of that happening. 
There's a question um, that is I'd like to get to before um, our hour ends, and this is on a slightly different angle. Um, Luke, is there a vision of extending the group of recipients, recipients or beneficiaries of digital classics to people with disabilities in the form, for example, um, of podcasts or materials or any other form? That's a great mm -hmm. question about podcasts, but that's something that's really important. Um, I'm glad that you brought that one up. Um, this is really tricky, uh, especially for the AR and VR interfaces. Um, so we we have a few workarounds for that, but uh, you know our, our VR headsets uh, require uh, putting on the headsets and uh, uh, using two different handheld controllers. Um, so there's uh, so many different accessibility challenges for adapting uh, uh, experiences from the VR headset um, uh, that we're we're trying to overcome. You know, what, one of those uh, that we found uh, to be somewhat useful right now is uh, Google Text-to-Speech. Um, this is a just an open service that anyone can use that uh, will, if there's text on a page, uh, will record that to an audio file um, uh, that uh, is actually of pretty good quality, um, especially for multiple languages. Um, so we can... Uh, we can publish uh, a number of different, uh, you know, languages of a single, like a, a museum curator goes and writes it in one language. You can now hear it read in 10 or 11 other uh, languages without it sounding too much like a robot. Um, but, but that's a great question. Um, as far as web accessibility, um, you know, web accessibility has been out there for, for ages uh, and it continues to be, you know, a practice that we uh, implement across our, applications, but it's, uh, you know, we're just figuring out how to adopt that for AR and VR. Thank you. There was a question um, from someone watching on YouTube. Um, what kind of training would I need to develop a critical view of all this data? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, uh, in some ways, I don't think a lifetimes of training could uh, give you a full critical view of all of the data. Uh, but uh, I guess to um, uh, I, I could speak from personal experience. I went into you know digital classics, um, uh, graduated um, with a degree work uh, working primarily uh, on translation of Theocritus and pastoral tradition, uh, sort of, uh, and then. Um, uh, went into uh, f uh, went fully into software industry. Uh, so I worked for three years at WMU, the radio station in DC, as a senior software engineer. Um, before I moved up to Cambridge and uh, started Archimedes to kind of ask these questions because uh, there was continuing to be the same sort of um, I guess disconnect in the various aspects of uh, uh, of the creative practice of, you know, studying classical philology and uh, my day-to-day -day job uh, working as a software engineer at the radio station. Uh, one of the secrets of, you know, being a participating in digital journalism and uh, that I was a part of at WMU was uh, all of these archives are very similar to the way that journalists need to browse and understand their content on their own websites as well, whether it's for the radio station, you know, WMU is uh, the NPR station in DC. So they were publishing the Diane Reem show and the Kojo Unamdi show uh, and had these, you know, uh, vast kind of data sets of audio files and video files and 360 video files that we needed to make searchable in, uh, in a very similar way as uh, we are currently. So I think that uh, for if you're interested in the software and uh, kind of project development side of things, uh, industry experience is really helpful. Any other context uh, uh, from other fields that you could draw on, if you go hang out with a bunch of game developers often uh, enough, you will, they'll start you know, rubbing off on you and getting you to think about the world in new ways. Um, even if your you know, creative interests all lie in the field of uh, classical studies or wherever they might lie. I don't know if that uh, quite answers the question, but that that's, mm -hmm. was the story for me. Yeah. Right, yeah. From what you were saying earlier, um, 
well, it sounded like you were saying that this kind of archiving or curating of collections, in fact, requires a is a critical training in a way um, more intense than just. Um, well, I'm not quite sure about the comparative there. What it's, what it's compared to, but is a very intense, you know, approach to the mind of the original creator. I think is how you put it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and without the, you know, without that understanding of how the what the data is, how it can be explored, what is that the top down view is just a cup. Uh, I'm worried that the interfaces that we might create and the knowledge you know, the, the digital representations of these artifacts will continue to, to be skewed to the sort by popular rather than the, you know, um, the ones that are the, the ways of exploring this data that are more true to the original uh, creators themselves. We have a bit of time left in our hour. Um, does anyone have a question? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, go ahead, Jack. Uh, well, I, I'm very excited to hear all of this, uh, and uh, you, you've set out a lot of wonderful uh, principles. I was wondering, if, is are we moving to uh, uh, like agreed upon standard formatting of metadata so that it can be searchable uh, across platforms? I mean, it can uh, can we can we interrogate? Uh, say the web, you know, for um, uh, those aspects that may not show up uh, on pulling up a uh, an, a page on on the internet, browsing the internet. Um, how how do we drill down into uh, what is uh, on the internet to to uh, to say, do the search for uh, hero across 12 ancient cultures? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I don't, um, uh, there are metadata standards developed across uh, in various different um, groups, uh, and sometimes they play nicely together. Um, you know, one of the most common that we see uh, that we have requested is just the Dublin Core uh, XML standards um, of uh, you know annotating data, um, but uh, for the commentaries in progress, for instance, um, we started uh, we built on this to extend uh, the Dublin Core ontology into our own uh, ontology that we could offer as a linked data API uh, for the backend services. Um, so if you want to, so each term or each word, keyword, key idea that's featured in the um, commentary, for instance, you're able to browse our API by that. So if there's hero, you know, uh, uh, in, in the commentary, you can give hero to our, give the word hero to our API and see annotated, you know, linked data uh, represented on our API responses. Uh, so th that's one you know, example, but that's, again, you know, that's a really hard problem. Uh, I was just talking with uh, someone who is making a digital archive of uh, dreams representing the collection of collective unconscious and found uh, you know, uh, in dream studies, there are uh, very, there, you know, it's a whole field of just annotating and uh, uh, determining what metadata are salient features that are useful for recognizing dreams, you know, for cultural heritage content for the texts and artifacts that we're working with. It's not that much different, I would say, uh, to try to find standards of annotation across all of those things to make them so they're searchable. Um, his archive was, uh, you know, uh, a uh, citizen's uh, citizen science of the collective unconscious. Uh, which I found really inspiring in some ways because I think that you know in in some in a, in a real way the uh, you know uh, the practice of us here and of h twenty four h um, cosmos society is a citizen science of the classical unconscious in some ways right uh, where we're uh, trying to work through understanding this um, and uh, making you know providing the digital versions of these things uh, somehow channels that original imaginative intent of those creators. Yeah, 
Can you point to tutorials that would help us get started? Uh, for the metadata? Um, uh, well, for the, yeah, the, the Dublin database uh, protocol. Yeah, definitely. Um, I could follow up after this this email uh, with, with Keith to send over some, some links there and other you know metadata standards ontologies. Uh, so, you know, some of the best or most comprehensive ontologies again that are out there are, come from digital journalism because uh, the tasks of archiving are very similar to the tasks that, that I think we as digital humanists face. What we can do, um, Luke, is, is to put all the links that you've provided in the slideshow, we'll put them onto the, the post as well so that people can follow and explore them for themselves, plus any that you can follow up with. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Awesome. It's a question about the sort by popular feature um, that we saw in the Acropolis Museum. Um, it wasn't exactly their website. It was a Google website. Was that a, a Google feature, I think, is the question here? Um, and my question, to, which I would add to that, is how is that rated if you have any idea? Um, I noticed in Google Image Search when I was doing something related to the homework you gave us, um, when you get to an individual result, you, you can see related items. You know, how is that measured? But um, yeah, the sort by popular. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, the related items is a great example of how pathways are kind of constructed. I don't know about the sort by popular. Um, but uh, I would imagine that this is a feature that is part of Google Arts and Culture, and then they just give it to all of the archives. They, they call them partners, I think. So all of the partners that display their data on the website, um, but we'd have to verify uh, they can speak for themselves on, on that aspect. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, and I, I'm only bringing it up, you know, I don't think there's anything demonstrably evil about sort by popular. Uh, just uh, the, the cup is a better example. The cup is uh, where it was most attractive, kind of looking you know, top down. That, that's a really good example, uh, whoever uh, brought that up, um, where it was misrepresented by uh, you know, the, the users that were beguiled by its beauty in, in some ways, right? Um, so, uh, but the, to, to your point, Keith, about the related items, um, I think that, the, that that is a good example of why it's important to be strategic about knowledge design. It's not just we're going to make all of these things accessible. It's that we need to, sorry, go ahead. For me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I didn't want to uh, cut your words. Um, I have a question about augmented reality. If you had a project, you started and you created something and then you found that something is wrong on the way, did, did you have uh, such an experience when you were recreating a building? Okay, it's not working out. We imagined this way, but it's not working out. Yeah, uh, uh, especially with augmented reality, a lot of things uh, can tend to go wrong. Um, so uh, one, uh, one thing that was the most challenging was uh, the Stella, um, the Dreaming Sphinx, the Dream Stella of Thutmose. Uh, that is the full, a full wall length Stella. So uh, initially we were thinking, well, if you're going to uh, you know, stand in the gallery and hold up your phone, you're holding up your phone next to the gallery and you want to see, uh, you want to start the experience, you're going to have to start like all the way back across the room before to, to fit the whole Stella into your camera on your phone before you can see the translations of the hieroglyphs and the other interactive content that's starting off of that. Um, and so we went through a bunch of different iterations of trying to figure out how not to stand all the way back across the room to start the experience. Um, and uh, uh, finally found that the image processing libraries that we were using were, um, can, we had included, you know, maybe 20 different images of the Stella from different angles. And that was causing more noise and confusion because it was trying to differentiate one version of the Stella over here version versus another version of the Stella over uh, at a different angle. And instead of just having one copy of the Stella that it could identify across any uh, any, any device or any, uh, any way that you're looking at it. Um, and we went through maybe 
oh gosh, it must have been a month of back and forth of prototyping and trying to make this uh, work in an optimal way, uh, optimal environment when you're in the gallery. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, the the real solution was just to take out all of the different images of the Stella, have a single image of it, build the database, and then build it to your device, and then it'll work at any angle, uh, or or most uh, better supported angles. Um, but for also for the reconstructions, um, we were working with the site architect at the Contrada Agnese project, James Hulmuller, uh, who. Uh, also, gave, um, one of the aspects that we haven't been able to work on yet, but I think it was his argument was we should show eight or nine different versions of the reconstructions there. Um, so it's not just like, hey, here's this reconstruction. This is what it was. You're, this is what you should imagine, right? It doesn't just paint it over for you. It says, here's eight or nine different possibilities. The roof could have gone like this. It could have gone like this. It could have been taller, you know, like, uh, because there's enough ambiguity kind of in the interpretation of his reconstructions as he's seeing the different possibilities that uh, um, w w one of the things that we hope to do with next steps for uh, archaeological sites in general is not offer a single ground truth reconstruction. The same way we don't offer a single ground truth, this is Homer. You know, we want to show the potentiality of interpretations and why those might be more interesting and be the second type of commentator rather than the first type of commentator that closes off all avenues of meaning. Well, before I close off this um, this hour, there was one last question um, about related data. If you include a picture of, for example, Achilles dragging Hector's body, are all the vases showing the same type of scene going to be included in the related data? If that's a, you know, um, that's the sort of question that you would need to ask. That's a, that's a perfect uh, question to think about when you're, I really love this question because uh, that's, uh, demonstrates thinking with st being strategic about knowledge design. When you look at that uh, cup of Achilles dragging Hector's body uh, or whatever vessel uh, Achilles dragging um, Hector's body, uh, uh, then because you have an understanding of why this is significant, you're able to make that pathway for other users coming behind you um, to see, okay, this isn't just you know, uh, a picture of two people fighting. This is Achilles drag dragging Hector's body. I wanna see all cups that mention, or all terracotta vessels that mention Achilles dragging Hector's body and you know, a biography of who Achilles was in classical mythology or something like that, right? Um, that's, uh, I'm not sure who wrote this, but uh, that, that's, a, that's a great example to uh, show why it's so important to uh, combine the digitization with a uh, deep understanding of the classical tradition. Well, I have the feeling this conversation could go on for a lot longer um, in a good way. Um, but we can't do that. So Luke, thank you for joining us. And thanks to you all for joining us in the Hangout and all of you out there for watching. See you next time.